All right. Well, folks, we have a very, very special guest today. Folks, David Sachs is on and here with us. Uh, just to give a brief intro for the few folks who may not know about David, uh, David was the uh, founding CEO at PayPal, hence a member of the PayPal Mafia. Oh, yeah. uh, he co-founded Craft Ventures, and he was an early investor in Facebook, Uber, SpaceX, Palantir, and Airbnb. So <laughs> Not a bad rap sheet. He's there. called pretty much every winner uh, over the past decade. Thank you so much for joining us. Good, good to be here. Listen, David, um, let's just start. We want to get into all kinds of different stuff with you because you're one of the most fascinating people that we have come into contact with. But let's start with the topical news that that is the economy. Today's economy, it ain't looking so good. What's your take? Yeah, the market's in free fall. It's been this way for the last several days. It's been horrible, really, since November of last year. That's when the Fed started getting very hawkish and started making very hawkish statements in response to inflation. So if you go back, this all started last summer when all of a sudden we got an inflation print of about 5.1%. Mm -hmm. The Fed and Yellen and so forth, they all told us it was transitory. Well, by the end of the year, inflation was up to almost 8%, it was 7.8%. That's when the Fed started taking it seriously. They started raising interest rates. They started a lot more rate increases are going, are you know, coming down the pike. And as a result of that, um, the markets have been you know, pretty much in free fall and really specifically in growth stocks. Mm -hmm. It's the worst environment I've seen for tech stocks since the dot-com crash. Wow. Mm -hmm. Enormous amounts of wealth have just been vaporized over the, really the last six months, but even the last two weeks, it's accelerated. And it's, it almost feels like it's becoming a panic to me at this point. Um, so we're, we're in the midst of the panic of 2022. So you see this more as a panic and not necessarily like a kind of a shakeout that's going on among, there've been a lot of tech companies that have hit unicorn status. There's been a lot of tech companies that have been success stories and might not necessarily have the best economic model when they don't have, you know, more VC checks coming in. So you see this as more of a panic situation. Well, I think it started as a shakeout and maybe a, a, a well-deserved correction, but now I think it's starting to get into overselling territory. And that's not to say that the markets can't keep going down because they can, but I think the sentiment's become so negative that um, definitely certain names are looking pretty cheap right now. But I'm not advising anyone to get in because you know the old saying about trying to catch a falling knife. That's right. Um, what one difference between now and say the year 2000 when we had the dot-com crash and that really persevered into 2001 and 2002 is that a lot of the companies back you know in the early 2000s there were a lot of fake companies. I mean there were right. companies without real revenue and earnings and questionable business models. They just had eyeballs, um, you know, and they ended up going out of business. You know that those companies lost anywhere from 90 to 100 percent. I think things are a little different now. The strongest companies in the world are tech companies. Um, even the with a lot of the more recent listings, uh, they many of them are strong. You know, the SaaS companies, which is what I invest in, it's basically software as a service. It's basically business software. These companies are, you know, meeting and beating their forecast each quarter. They are, I mean, they're selling a lot of software to you know to B two B. And they're hitting their revenue and earnings targets, and yet they're being you know pummeled right now. Hmm. And and if and if a company misses its forecast, we're seeing instant 20, 30 percent corrections. So Unity is down like 35 percent today because it missed. Um, so we're seeing you know if if you miss your forecast, um, you're going to get really punished. But even if you hit your numbers, the market is going way down because of multiple compression right now. So some of this is justified, um, but some of it is it's starting to get into panic territory, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, look, it, it, the, the thing that, as you well pointed out, is the economy is very different, right, than it was in 2000 when we had the, the last dot-com sort of bubble burst. And, and as you said, a lot of fake companies. But now, really, our economy is driven uh, in, in at least the last few years almost exclusively by growth in the, in the tech economy. Is there anything associated with this sort of free fall that it could be sort of tech lash? It's a specific sort of um, makes no sense, but a, a retribution type public sentiment, or is it is it all underlying economics? Well, the fundamental cause of what's been happening over the last six months is that over during COVID, you had this massive government overreaction to COVID in the form of money printing. 
And so between the Fed and Congress with all of the COVID stimulus money, and then the Fed doing quantitative easing, you had about two, sorry, $10 trillion of basically money printing. And this concluded with that last $2 trillion um, COVID bill that Biden signed in his first quarter in office. I think it was the American Rescue Plan. Remember, they passed that along straight party lines, the last $2 trillion. There were plenty of economists saying, we don't need this. You know, mm -hmm. We're coming out of COVID. This is unnecessary. Larry Summers warned them that it could create inflation. Stanley Druckenmiller, the famed macro investor, warned them, don't do this. The consumer is already back. Retail is already 15% above trend, meaning if you look at the trend line of consumer spending, it was back and then some. Right. And yet they persisted anyway with this final $2 trillion of stimulus. And I think it was a cynical move to try and basically flood the zone with money before the midterm elections. And instead, it completely backfired mm. because what it did is it caused that massive spike in inflation that began last summer, that 5.1% spike that is now up to 8%. So all this money has come washing through the system. And at the same time, you are flooding the zone with money, you're also paying people not to work. Right. So, you know, inflation is caused by too much money chasing too few goods. And when you've got too much money in the system and people aren't working to produce those goods, that's when you get a massive amount of inflation. Um, and of course, the rise in energy prices have been caused by this Ukraine war. That's contributed to the problem as well. So you've got this massive inflation and the Fed then has been reacting to try and control that inflation. And in the process, I think they're going to cause the U.S. economy to go into a very severe recession. Oof. We saw that in Q1, it was negative 1.4% growth. It was a shocker number. Mm -hmm. um, technical definition of a recession is two quarters of negative growth. We've had the first quarter of negative growth. If, if Q2 is negative, then we'll be in a recession. So um, I think we're headed for a very severe downturn. And this was all basically caused by government engage, engaging in this like whiplash where 100%. first they put out the punch bowl for way too long and they let the party go on for way too long. They printed all this money we didn't need and then they take it away so rapidly and so violently that it causes the stock market to crash. So I think people are going to look back at this and this, just, this is more of the like folly of the COVID policy. We, this is the economic version of the COVID policy that we had over the last couple of years, where we just had this ridiculous overreaction to COVID. And now we're finally paying for it. And I think there's going to be a very severe recession. Well, I have a question. So, yeah. Um, you know, a lot of folks got interested in Bitcoin specifically because it's not beholden to the Federal Reserve. You know, no government can control the supply of Bitcoin. So it was seen as kind of like an inflation hedge, but Bitcoin's been taking a hit as well. Do you have any reason, you know, you think that's been happening? Yeah, I think it's because liquidity is coming out of the system. Mm -hmm. So th this is the irony, is that if the Fed prints too much money, then that's an argument for Bitcoin for the reason you said, which is Bitcoin doesn't, it, the, the number of Bitcoin is a fixed number. So it's not dependent on, it's, it's a non-fiat money. You, it, you never have to worry about government debasement because Bitcoin's backed by math. We know how many Bitcoin there are going to be in the world. Right. The, but, but the irony is that the more government prints, the more liquidity there is in the system. And you can think of the crypto market as a liquidity sponge, mm. and it sucks up a lot of that liquidity. So when people are feeling really flush, they can invest in more speculative things, and that includes crypto. So the irony is that when the liquidity goes away, the dollar gets stronger and crypto goes down. And that's what you're seeing right now. Mm. Um, so we, you know, we don't know exactly where it's going to land. I mean, long term, I'm a believer in crypto. The problem is that the prices of crypto got inflated along with everything else. We had this enormous asset bubble created by 10 trillion of, of money printing by the government. You know, it's just it's just fascinating. I I could listen to him talk about about the economy and where we are. I agree with everything you had to say. But but one thing I want to get into is back to the beginning. I want to go back to the PayPal days with you mm -hmm. because this is just fascinating to me. For those who don't follow this stuff closely, you and your your group of folks have have basically been at the ground floor, as Smug said in the introduction of an incredible amount of massive success stories, uh, not just in tech, just like throughout the economy. Tell us about that adventure, how that began. Yeah, I mean, it really, well, it began for me when I got a call from Peter Thiel, who I'd gone to college with. We had both gone to Stanford in the uh, early 90s. And I went off to go to law school and, you know, I 
graduated and was working at McKinsey as a first year management consultant. And then Peter called me up to tell me about this company he was creating and he convinced me to join. And that was back in 1999. You know, I thought I had missed the whole dot com thing because I was in law school from 1995 to 1998. And that's when, you know, Amazon and Yahoo and eBay and these all right. these companies were taken off. And I thought I had missed the whole thing because I'd been at Stanford and the Bay Area and Silicon Valley during, you know, in from 1990 to 1994. And then, you know, my friends who graduated in 95 and stayed in the area were like part of this incredible dot com <laughs> wave. You're like, what's so, up with this? <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm like, I was a stupid person who went to law school when I should have stayed, stayed put. Um, so I was like, damn, you know, I missed that whole thing. And then Peter called me in 99 and I ended up going back to, uh, to Silicon Valley and, and joined the company that had become PayPal. And um, about six months after I joined the company, we had the dot-com crash. Yeah. And so we had to basically persevere through the dot-com crash. And one of the remarkable things about PayPal is that it was primarily built um, during and in the wake of the, the dot-com crash. Right. And you had a really amazing group of founders and really amazing group of people sort of persevere through the dot com crash to create, you know, a landmark company. Which is so incredible because if I'm not mistaken, PayPal was basically, I think it might have even been the first IPO post 9 11, right? I mean, this is, this, we're talking about seriously tumultuous times. And, and to be able to weather that, I mean, I guess that sets you on the path for success. Yeah, we IPO'd in early 2002, and it was it was the first IPO after 9/11, the first IPO, first certainly the first tech IPO since the dot-com crash. And people were very skeptical. There was a, uh, I think there was an article in the local newspaper called uh, "Earth to PayPal," you know, basically saying you didn't get the message that you're supposed to be dead, <laughs> you know, uh, you you didn't get the message that tech companies are over, and uh, you know you miss, must have missed the dot-com crash because you're not supposed to exist. And then the, you know, the IPO was successful. And then later that year, we ended up selling the company to eBay. Um, and then, you know, down the road, eBay spun it back out. And today it's, you know, a hundred billion dollar company, roughly. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of being part of the PayPal mafia, you know, we were missed to not bring up Elon Musk on the show today, especially given how he's basically the news cycle every day on, on That's something incredible. Elon tweeted. He's now become a political figure, yeah. David. Did you ever right. suspect that? No, I mean, I thought he was really busy doing SpaceX and Tesla. And um, I mean, I, based on conversation with him, I knew that he felt similar to the way I do about free speech, but I didn't know that he would take up this banner and really run with it. But I've been very gratified to see him do that. Yeah, the WS, uh, Wall Street Journal had an article saying that Elon has a shadow crew that was advising him to take, are you part of the shadow crew? Can you confirm that on today's episode? <laughs> I, I was, I was named as part of the shadow crew, but, um, but it, I don't know if, I don't think that exists. I mean, I never advised Elon to, to buy Twitter, you know, um, I expressed words of encouragement and support, but he never consulted with me about it. And I never gave him, I never consulted with him about it. So I don't know where they got that from. Um, <laughs> well, it's, it's really, I mean, look, from my perspective, it's one of the most patriotic things I've seen in a long time, yeah. right? I mean, if, if you believe in free speech, if you believe in free expression and you've watched what's happened in this country through censorship and this sort of elimination of dissent all across this country, and you have the means to do something about it, you know, everybody's looking at each other like, are they going to do anything? And all of a sudden, Elon <laughs> jumps right into the midst of it and probably takes the, the biggest tiger by the tail. Absolutely. I think that's right. I mean, you know, this wave of censorship had so much inertia behind it. You know, it started several years ago with just a few isolated figures being thrown off, you know, and they were thrown off because they were basically unpopular, or considered provocateurs. You have people like a Milo Yiannopoulos or an Alex Jones. We were told at that time, these are isolated cases. But sure enough, more and more people kept getting deplatformed and thrown off until finally a sitting president of the United States gets deplatformed in what was it January of 2020, and then the censorship spread to financial deplatforming. You had the Canadian truckers yes. who were involved in that protest simply by honking your horns, or you donated to them twenty five dollars so that a trucker could buy a hot meal or something like that. You could have your bank account frozen. It's like financial deplatforming. And now, more recently, you have entire categories of thought and opinion being banned from social networks if you said the wrong thing about the efficacy of vaccines or cloth masks or where the virus might have come from, you could be censored and deplatformed 
And now they're spreading it to other types of uh, opinions like climate change and uh, gender identity. You know, they're basically outlawing entire categories of opinion. And does anybody think it would have stopped there? This thing, this no. galloping wave of censorship had so much inertia behind it, it would have kept going and going until basically there's, it would have been fully prescribed what we can say and think on these social networks. And then along comes Elon. And it's like one man basically drawing a line in the sand saying this has gone far enough and I'm gonna do everything I can to stop it. And I think his example, wherever this goes from here, I think his example has been extremely powerful because it was long overdue that somebody basically stand athwart this censorship and yell stop. Totally, totally. And I, I think it actually extends beyond that in my view because I, I think not only is it the censorship piece, but, but it affects everything. And you can see if this doesn't work, Right. If, if this piece of his effort to try to take over Twitter, if that doesn't work, you can see a scenario where you have basically a conservative economy and a liberal economy. Right. You can have two worlds living in parallel. I can't imagine anything worse for this country. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that's sort of the logical result of where all this deplatforming goes. I mean, you kind of see it where you've got YouTube and Rumble. Right. And yeah. um, and I think that type of dichotomy it could sort of percolate through the whole economy. I think you're absolutely right. Um, it's already kind of happening, you know. Um, there isn't there like kind of conservative coffee brand. Yeah, that's, well. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like you know, it's funny because you see anytime you see on a, a conservative podcast, it's it's like you know whatever names you haven't heard of, but they're all conservatives. And then you go to a liberal one, and it's like Coca Cola. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, you know, it's part of it also is this sort of uh, woke capitalism, right? You have all these Fortune 500 companies becoming woke and sticking their nose into issues where it has, where it doesn't belong. And you saw like Bob Chapek at Disney stuck his nose into what was happening in Florida and he got his snout whacked by, you know, DeSantis. But it just shows the way that like these Fortune 500 uh, companies are getting politically active and mobilized on one side of the aisle, on one side of the issues. And I, th I think you're right. The logical result is we're going to end up with a conservative Coke and a liberal Pepsi in every industry, yeah. you know, where people can't live with each other. It's not, it's not good. I mean, it'd be a lot better if companies would just stay out of politics and uh, we didn't try to politicize everything in this country. Oh, a hundred percent. You know, I, I think you raise a good point with the DeSantis deal with Disney in Florida. It may be the first time. I mean, as long as I've been in politics, which is 20 plus years, you, you have CEOs basically believing that conservatives will hold down the free market capitalist view. Right. They'll basically give them free shots. So you got to do what you got to do to try to placate the left. And that means funding every one of their causes. It means giving lip service to absolutely wacky ideas that have nothing to do with their business model whatsoever. And I feel like this is a little bit of a change, right? It's like all of a sudden yeah. there's some repercussions on the other side for getting involved in something. You have no idea what it is. Yeah. I think there, there, there is a big change. This is the populist transformation of the Republican party. And look, I, I believe that look, the, the fundamental choice in, in, in your economy is whether it's going to be, a free enterprise system or a planned socialist style economy. And I believe in a free, free enterprise system, but look, you know, a, a, an economy that's dominated by a bunch of powerful monopolies is not a free market. And I think it's long overdue that Republicans take a page out of uh, Teddy Roosevelt's playbook. He was the trust buster. He's on Mount Rushmore for a reason, mm -hmm. which is he protected the right of the ordinary man to work. Yeah. And that is what Republicans need to do today. These big, powerful companies that are huge monopolies should not have the right to cut pe off people's access to the banking system mm -hmm. or to end their freedom of speech because they have views that these big companies disagree with. That is fundamentally un-American. Uh, uh, yeah. Stax, you want to get into politics? This sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> You're too smart of a man to do that, but I, I swear to you, it would be very refreshing to hear your point of view on the national stage for this. I think Roosevelt's on Mount Rushmore for a reason. That is the playbook Republicans need to follow today. Um, you know, it's not a free market when we are dominated by a cartel of large monopolies who put a, who create a barricade to free speech and our ability to hold the opinions that we want, which is basically where this whole thing was headed, right? Where they're not only cutting off your right to speak on social media, which that is the right, that is the town square now. Elon's totally right about that, that Twitter and social networks like it, they are the town square. 
If they deplatform you, deplatform you, if they cut off your right to participate on those networks, what effective free speech right do you have in this country? I don't think you have one. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the courthouse steps and pull out a soapbox? People yeah. think you're a crazy person. That's yeah. not free speech anymore. Free speech has been privatized. It exists on these social networks. That is where you go for political speech. And if you're cut off, if you're deplatformed, you do not have a free speech right in this country. That right has to be protected. Republicans have to protect that because Democrats certainly won't. Oh, yeah. Round of applause. <laughs> <that one. laughs> Thank you. God bless. It's so nice to hear somebody in your line of work say that. <laughs> Listen, all of our guests, we have three big questions. And these are the ones that everybody sort of pays attention to, Mr. Sachs. So this, this, is, uh, this is where the rubber meets the road. But the first question is, if you can plan your last meal on earth, what would it be? You know, uh, it'd probably be pretty straightforward. I'd just get a, a well-done steak and a uh, baked potato. That's that a well-done steak is not one that we hear often. On the- <laughs> <laughs> right, and, a well-done New York steak. Yeah, I like it. Uh, I think it's called Trump style. <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And a Coca-Cola for him. I don't know if you want want some kind no, of. No, I might. I might want a. I might want a, a glass of a Screaming Eagle or something like that. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> if you're gonna go out. You might as well go out big. Yeah. I love it. All right. So, second question. I'm very interested to hear your perspective on this. If you never got into your line of work at all, right, and you have this huge amount of time that you can fill with a blue sky answer of what else you would want to do in life, what would it be? You know, it's interesting. I, I, um, every, every few years I discover some intellectual interest that, you know, it's, it's interesting to me and I can, I kind of go deep on it. Um, you know, I would say like being an architect would be a lot of fun. I think I would have liked a job like that. Um, more recently I've been kind of getting deeper into understanding international relations, reading some of that literature. Mm-hmm. Um, I gave a talk recently about America's policy on Ukraine. So, yeah, those are two areas that interest me right now. Yeah. I mean, and architect building things. I get it. It makes perfect it makes sense. sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, it's a similar it's a similar type of thing where you walk into a space and imagine what it could be. And that's basically what we do when we create startups or invest in startups is you have to imagine what it could be because yeah. it starts off being nothing. Yeah. Yep. A hundred percent. All right. So here's the third question. You got to stick with me on this because I got to explain it. Our view is that everybody's motivated by one of two things, the thrill of victory or the agony of defeat. But here's where it requires some explanation is because absolutely nobody loves defeat or doesn't like victory. It's what motivates you from one way or another. And the thrill of victory person is always the sunny optimist, glass half full, charging up the hill because they know they can make the next accomplishment, basically. The agony of defeat person is a someone who his ever every accomplishment lasts about five minutes. They appreciate it for like less than 10 minutes. But every defeat or setback they've ever, ever had in life, it sticks with them forever. They wear it like a backpack and they work that much harder to try to overcome to make sure that that never happens again or they can reach the next level. David Sachs, where do you find yourself? I mean, I think there's elements of both philosophies that I would identify with. Um, I mean, I can tell you at PayPal, what we did is um, the team was very paranoid about all the things that could go wrong. I mean, you have to be optimistic enough to want to create a company in the first place, but every day we would imagine all the things that could kill us. And then we would work systematically to, to work away those risks. You basically try to eliminate those existential risks. So by being paranoid about all the things that can go wrong, you actually create a roadmap for yourself as an entrepreneur to eliminate those things. And if you eliminate all the ex- existential risks then you survive and, and prosper. Hmm. So it's sort of a combination of both. I mean, I do think about the downsides a lot, but, but in the service of trying to go for some big upside, basically not just risk avoidance. Yeah. Well, r- whatever that amalgamation is, I think a lot of people want to subscribe to it because you've had success, like almost nobody else. I can't thank you enough for joining us on the program. Really appreciate your time. Stay in touch. We'd love to know what you're up to. Uh, So anytime you're welcome on the Variety Program. Awesome. Great to be with you guys. It was fun. Thanks.